Warren. your hands together and bless the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of God. Ephesians chapter 2. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. sake of time I'm going to incorporate much of what has been read earlier but we're going to ask that you return to verse 19 if you have it you may indicate less than I'm saying amen And it reads, Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit, in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. Pray with us as we enter what I would like to call this the church series. The church series. And I want to entitle this, The Church More Than Bodies in a Building. More Than Bodies in a Building. And I want to subtitle this, God's Dwelling Place. God's dwelling place. If you will bow your heads with me for a word of prayer. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for the opportunity and the privilege to stand behind this sacred desk to say a few words for a few moments to these, Lord God, who have gathered to hear word. Father, I pray that you would speak less of me and all of thee. Have your way, O oh God. Have your way, O oh God. Now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O oh Lord. You're my strength and my redeemer. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Stories told of a gathering where a movement more than a moment a group of people thousands gathered together to see to, amen hear what one person would say as a result of things that were being put out there and their 
when that individual went to work to doing those things, they're gathered they, at the end and throughout the entire presentation, entire performance, they were excited. They were indeed brought to their feet. Amen. They were cheering. They were excited. I cannot express it anymore. They had driven for miles and they had waited for hours to come in to see how this person would do, how they would perform. Um, yes, they watched for some 60 minutes. They noted how the individual performed and how he conducted himself. And many said that today he indeed established himself as one that had the ability to make a difference. It would be one thing if we were talking about someone who had come to deliver a word but there were some 23,000 people who had come to see, amen, Steph Curry respond to what many would say that he was nobody without Kevin Durant. They cheered their lungs out. They wanted him to know that we are with you regardless of what they may say about your abilities. These bodies paid money to come into an arena to see their chief and star performer do what they knew he could do. You know the rest of the story. Although they won the game, they wound up losing the series. Many of you probably thought about folk packing the building, cheering. Many of you probably thought, well, what kind of worship service was that? It could have been a concert. It could have been any given number of things. But sadly, the zest and the zeal that we see in a lot of the things that are associated with pastimes that we enjoy, the church somehow or another pales in comparison. Oftentimes we come in and we want to hear some singing, but not too much. We want to be able to participate in our giving, but guess what? Don't talk about it too much. We want to be inspired. We want to be encouraged. We want to hear what does say the Lord, but preacher, not too much. Why? Because there are so many things that are going on in the world in which we live and so many things that are packed into these things that we call our lives that oftentimes we just want to be able to come in and we want to get out and we want to go home so we can shut it down. Over the course of the next few weeks that I shared or however long the Lord directs, both the messages on Sunday and Tuesday will take an in-depth look at the church. When I use the word church or the term church, I'm talking about the ecclesia. Amen, the role, amen, the understanding of the bride of Christ, the body of Christ, the ecclesia, amen. The word is found in our New Testament 114 times. Ek, amen, means out of, amen. Ecclesia come from the Greek word kaleo, which means called out. Those who are called out, those who are brought out of darkness into the marvelous light. When we look at the church, the church is a community. Those who have, amen, moments where we come together for koinonia because we have all things in common. The church should have this understanding that we have been called to be lights and shining examples to a lost and dying world. We have been endued, endowed, amen, and empowered by the Holy Spirit to make a difference in this world. However, what I feel is pivotal in this, all of this is that we possess more, get this, more than what we are doing. That God has given you something to do. That is to tell somebody about Jesus. 
All too many times we tend to think that it must come, amen, from the vantage point of having a Bible in our hands. And oftentimes we think that it comes, amen, from having the ability or having a, an appropriate location wherein we can come and tell somebody about Jesus. But you must know that the greatest sermon that anybody could ever preach is by living a life that exemplifies and uplifts the name of Jesus. Is it all right? And because many are failing to do this, I feel that the church, the body of Christ, the one that says, that said to Peter, amen, upon this church I will build my gates, uh, upon this rock I will build my church and the very gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I find that the church, or I feel that the church is now in what I would like to call an identity crisis. An identity crisis, one that is primarily linked to folk who really don't know what the church is all about. Oftentimes, it's because we fail to distinguish between the crowd that is congregated and those who are committed to the core. Can I get a witness in here? But what I want you to know, and I'll deal with this on Tuesday night, amen, I feel that the church's purpose for existing is tied to a lifestyle and a way of living that is devoid of three things. A lifestyle and a way of living that is devoid of three things. One, scriptural standards. If we are not living in accordance to the word of God, then we're just doing our own thing. But what is the Bible and what is the role that it plays in our lives? A lot of folk are doing a lot of things these days, but is it biblical? We got to go back to the basis. We got to go back, amen, to the word of God. It's also devoid, a lifestyle and living that is devoid of sound speech. Sound speech. Are we truly able to let our yeas be yea and our nays be nay? Or are we just blowing hot air? Look at your neighbor say, not me, not me. Let's face it, we have become a cliche-driven society. And in many respects, we are living in a soundbite moment. If it sounds good, we'll repeat it. Hello, somebody, we'll like it, we'll share it, we'll forward it. But at the end of the day, is it what thus saith the Lord? Scriptural standards, sound speech, a lifestyle in living that's devoid of thirdly seasoned saints. You've got to have somebody in your life. Somebody's to be honest with you, who know what it means to live this thing. One of the greatest assets that any congregation has is related to those individuals who have come through life and get this because they have seen a few things. They can speak to life's issues because, guess what? I've experienced it firsthand. Those mothers and fathers that can remind us, amen, that it pays to serve the Lord. They can tell us that you ain't got to go out here, get caught out, strung out, and drop out of life only to come to the realization that you didn't have to go through that. We need somebody to tell, amen, our young men and women, amen, stand there. Keep your hand in God's hand, amen. He will take care of you. Is that all right in here this morning? I'm going to talk about this more on Tuesday, but between now and, then, I want, now and then, I want you to ponder these in your spirit. Before I go any further, I want to bring a level of clarity to today's message. Let me bring a level of clarity. Oftentimes there's a tendency for people to put the guard up because amen, they, they think, oh, he can ready to bless us out right now. 
Pastor, getting ready to put on song blast. Messages like this, amen, sometimes have a rebuking nature or quality about them. However, the church is not an institution that is filled with perfect people. Uh-oh, watch out. It is a sanctuary for sinners who have been saved by grace. In many respects, it sometimes has become a nursery for God's little sweet children to come in and say, no, you can't do that. Have a seat over there. Be good. When they don't want to be good. You ain't going to have no cookies. You can't play with the others. You can't have recess today. Every now and then we got to see that there's something about being humbled in the fact that God is just letting you sit down for a moment to get yourself together, to get your mind right. There's some Sundays you'll see me come in and guess what, I'll sit right there. Why? Because I need to be ministered to. Is that all right? Sometimes I give out. Sometimes I feel empty. And every now and then I need to be filled. I need to be reminded about who God is and what he desires to do in my life. The late theologian Charles Haddon Spurgeon called the church, hello somebody, the dearest place on earth. For he said, give yourself to the church, ye that are members of the church. You have not found it to be perfect. And I hope that you feel almost glad that you have not. If I had never joined the church until I found the one that was perfect, I would have never joined one at all. Because the moment that I did join it, hello somebody, I would have spoiled it. For it would not have been a perfect church after I became a member of it. But still imperfect as it is, Spurgeon said, it is the dearest place on earth to all of us, all of us who have first given ourselves to the Lord. For we can learn about him, about his love for us, and the things that he desires to do in our lives. For Spurgeon, in spite of all the things that life had dealt him and all the things that he had experienced along the way, there was something about the church. Is there anybody here to know what I'm talking about? In spite of all the stuff that you have gone through, in spite of the week that some of you have had, and if you had one like me, it was full of ups and downs. Hello, somebody lefts and rights. Hello, somebody even an occasional uppercut that the enemy tried to send my way. But thank God I'm still here. I'm still standing because I've been kept by the grace of of God. Oh, Pastor White, what are you talking about? Our text is a good one. We must know that we're more than bodies in a building. That God has done something in your life. Whereas people will try to marginalize you, they may try, amen, to ignore you, they may try to do things, understand this, you are serving the most high God. For the moment, the minute, the second that you begin to focus on people, the moment, the minute, the second that you begin to try to live and please people is the moment, the minute, and second that you become, amen, discouraged about this thing called life. Amen. The moment, the minute, the second that you try to please everybody, hello, somebody, is the moment, the minute, the second, amen, that you will take your eyes off the prize of the one amen who has brought you out of darkness and brought you into a marvelous light Paul here is writing to remind his readers and us about the beauty of salvation and what the Lord does in the lives of his people 
God has done some awesome things. He's writing to the saints at Ephesus. Ephesus was a religious center. Matter of fact, it was one of the great ones of its day. All kinds of things had happened at Ephesus. Amen. In Ephesus, there was the famous temple of Diana, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. All kinds of pagan issues and things and all kinds of rituals were carried on there. But God would use this place, this place, hello, somebody, where folk would come in from all over the world. He would use this place, amen, to have the gospel preached there. God will use this place to come in, amen, to deal with all of the stuff that happened in Ephesus. All sorts of silver images were made, amen, to worship idol gods, witchcraft, and magical arts were practiced in Ephesus, amen. But even in the midst of all of this, all of this pagan, not pagan, idolatry, and all of these things, there were a few Jews who were practicing their religion in the city there. What does this say to us today? That even in the most pagan, even in the most foul environments, you might find some folk, amen, who are just downright religious. Can I just call it what it is? We live in a day and age where a lot of folk are strictly religious. Folk who will call Jesus' name but not have relationship. Folk, amen, that will show up and be given the opportunity to speak in churches and guess what, not have relationships. Folk, amen, that will show up, amen, in, on campuses and, and will be given a platform in forums here, there, and everywhere, but not really knowing who Jesus is. That's why it was so important for God to send Paul there to come in and to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, to come against Diana worship and to say that there is no God but the true and living God, amen, who sent his son Jesus that he might die for the sins of the world. In fact, when Paul arrived at Ephesus, he found certain disciples. If we were to go back to Acts 19 and 1, he found them there who were professed followers of Jesus Christ, who had received the teaching of John the Baptist but who were ignorant of the full message of the gospel of Jesus and the person and work of the Holy Spirit. These individuals were, were, were about 12 in number. And Paul was quick to discern their lack of understanding and he propounded upon them two questions. His first question was, did you receive the Holy Ghost when you believed? Hello, somebody. Acts 19 and 2, and I quote, amen, the American Standard Version. Amen. Here, when Paul asked this question, it was not as the King James Version will suggest, where that sometime after they believed they had received the Holy Spirit. Actually, Paul wanted to know if they were, in fact, born again. Uh-oh. Their response would have been a sure indication, hello in here, that they knew what Paul was talking about. For they replied, we did not so much as hear as to whether or not the Holy Spirit was given. In other words, the King James said, we didn't know nothing about the Holy Ghost. Oh, can I get a witness up in here? I believe in large part the problem with the church today is that we fully do not understand what it means to be spirit-filled. We fully do not understand what it means to live, amen, and to be governed and to be guided and to be graced with the power and presence of the Holy Ghost in our lives. See, oftentimes we, we, we get it confused, we get it twisted, amen. We think because we can do the huckabuck, we can do ashatatabasha, hello somebody, we can speak in tongues, amen, and we can sound good. But guess what? You can call out any list of cars and sound spiritual. Cadillac, Hyundai, hello somebody. Toyota. Can I keep it real with you in here today? Somebody said, Pastor, why? yeah, I'm all right. But you must. 
must understand the reason why I'm going here is that far too many people are captivated by what they perceive as spirituality. Well, I tell people all the time, just because somebody can hoop, it doesn't mean that they're preaching the gospel. Uh oh, leave it alone, boy. We can talk about the church. The word of God. We need to know that the church is not comprised of or composed of, hello, somebody, of big eyes and little U's. But the church, amen, is composed and comprised of people who are working out their own soul salvation. In other words, hello somebody, I'm trying to get myself right. I'm trying to get my stuff together. I'm trying, hello somebody, to hear from God from myself. And because I'm trying to get myself together, hello, I ain't got time to try to get the speck out of your eye when I got the beam in my eye. Uh oh. Happy birthday, Robin Grant. I just want to reach out to you. We're going to do the crossover later. Hello. But get this. Paul realized that he could not build a church at Ephesus on folk who had a flimsy understanding of who God was. A flimsy understanding of this, amen, it's like this. If you're praising God because you got a new car, what happens when the car breaks down? What happens when the car gets old? If you're praising God because you got money in the bank, what happens when the money's gone? Huh? I want you to get excited. Hello, somebody. When you get money, hell, I want you to get excited. But guess what? Don't get excited about the money. Hey, man, but get excited. God did it again. And when you recognize him, guess what? You'll come back the next week. He did it again and again. I would say again and again and again. But Paul is saying here that the presence of the Holy Spirit in a Christian's heart is the test of true Christianity. For he says in Romans 8 and 9, if a man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. If you don't have him on the inside, these are the people, amen, who will stand up and say, have I not prophesied? Have I not done many mighty works? And he will say, depart from me, ye worker of iniquity. I never knew you. Is this all right? A fragmentary gospel is a spurious and dangerous gospel of another kind. If a man upon his believing does not receive a man, hallelujah, the indwelling, hello, somebody of the Holy Spirit, he has not believed unto salvation that produces faith. For no man can say Jesus is Lord but by the Holy Ghost. That's scripture. But Pastor White, you got a few moments before we get out of here. What do you want us to leave here with today? But before we go any further, let us take a few minutes to delve deeper into our text by making the following observations. Understand this, that first and foremost, Paul shares and writes here for all of us to know in verses 11 through 12 that were read earlier, that we all have a past that's littered with problems. Huh? You mean that person didn't come into this world perfect? No. Look at somebody and say, I'm not perfect, and I ain't talking about you either. Because sometimes, you know, people get mad at you. We all have pasts that are littered with problems. In verse 11, Paul says, Wherefore remember that you being in time past Gentiles in the flesh who are called 
uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands. That at, the, at that time ye were without Christ. The way you were being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise. Get this. Having no hope and without God uh oh, in the world. Paul here is addressing the fact that there was some decision, some dissension and division brimming about as a result of some who were of the circumcision, who were Jews, and the uncircumcision, who were the Gentiles. These were folk who were trying to make a distinction about we are Abraham's seed. You ain't nobody. Some folk, if we're not careful, will do this in the church. I've been saved all my life. You've got to get to where I am. Uh-oh, leave that alone, preacher. If there's anything that's hindering the growth of the church... It is folk who think that they're better than somebody else. Can I teach it? But understand this, it was going both ways. You have some Gentiles who fail to understand that there is a process. That you can't, amen, continue to be in the flesh and serve God. Can I submit to you that one of the biggest problems in the church today or with the church today is that there's too much flesh that's been allowed to come in and what we've done, we have dumbed down, and I hate to use that term, but we have dumbed down the understanding of what it means to serve God. That what it means to worship him in spirit and in truth. Yeah, we want to come as we are, but guess what? Boy, go back to your notes. You're going to get in trouble. Come as you are, but understand this. Once you have an encounter with Jesus, he'll change everything about you. Because once you understand what your past was all about, my past was full of mess. My past was full of mistakes. My past was full of a whole lot of things that I am so ashamed of. And we've got what we would call, amen, an immediate past and a distant past. Now, your distant past should be stuffed to, guess what? God, I thank you for delivering me from that. I was messed up. God, I was doing everything that I was big enough and bad enough to do. Amen. Though I'm talking about those that, guess what, folks saw you one way. But once you got out of the spotlight, you did it, amen, and guess what? You enjoyed doing it. And if you're not careful now, you will think back to way, amen, you were, how you used to go in and shake a leg and break a leg and do all stuff, and you'll find yourself smiling. I had it back then, didn't I? Every generation has had its version of backing it up. Back in the 70s when you were doing the bump, hello somebody. Leave it alone, leave it alone, leave it alone. But Paul is quick to point out that everybody has a past. For earlier in chapter 2, verses 2 and 3, he says something, and that thing stuck with me. He says, get this, where in times past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the powers of the prince of the powers of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom we also had our conversation in times past, amen, the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. 
Everybody has a past. But thank God, thank God for where you are right now. Thank God for your present. Amen. Thank God that you're, amen, saved. And when you look back where the Lord has brought you from, you can say the things that I used to do, I don't do no more. The places that I used to go, I don't go no more. I can say that God has done something in my life. Secondly, secondly, I got to move home. In verses 13 through 18, we see, again, building upon this present, that we all have a present that is live with peace. Because you're now saved. You don't have to have all that stuff hanging over your head because it's covered by the what? Blood. The blood. You don't have to eat man. I'm not talking about those moments when you feel, when you look back and you're smiling, when you used to go, and you could, like I said, you were doing the bump, hustle, bus stop, or whatever you were doing. Somebody said, boy, I ain't heard that in years. But think about it. And you smile because guess what? You had your bell bottoms on, you did your afro. then there's some things that don't produce a smile. Some things you think about and it produces a level of shame. How did I do that? How could I have done that? The moments where you went to the altar and prayed and said, Lord, you deliver me from this. I ain't going to do it no more. And you went right back out. Later on in the same day, is saying is that because you are saved focus on the fact of where you are in your right now in the fact that once you have the understanding that once saved God is with you and the only way you can get out of it is the way you tell God I don't want you no more but he's always he's always standing at the door knocking there's something, amen, about the Holy Ghost. He's always reminding you to come back home. You ain't got to stay out there. You can get it right. Hello, somebody. Amen. In the midst of it all, Paul wanted them to know. To get this. Verse 13, he said, but now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were afar off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. The blood. I'm near now. I'm a child. I have been received. Amen. I've been adopted. I've been engrafted into the family of God. For he is our peace who have made both one and have broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make himself of twain one new man, so making peace. When we're in this place, we need to recognize that God has done something in our lives. When you see somebody praising God, although you may not know the particulars and all the specifics, hello, somebody, you should want to rejoice with them. Huh? Amen. When Sister Joyce, amen, is in here praising God, amen, we should want to rejoice. We should want to, amen, join in with her. Amen, because of the simple fact, amen, we don't know all that she's been through, but because she can stand up and open up her mouth and give God glory, somebody in here should want to open up their mouths as well and say, God, if you bless her, I know that you will bless me. God, I know if you brought me out before, I know that you can do it again. Peace is our spiritual birthright, and I'm just about done. And once we can move beyond uh, our issues, we can focus on what God has assigned to our hands in the here and now. Think about it. It's a beautiful thing. And can I be real with you for a minute? What would happen if we all came to church with the mindset of just worshiping the Lord? If we just came just to give God glory. 
if we didn't look for the praise team, amen, to usher us in, if we didn't wait for the worship leader to remind us to give God praise, if we didn't wait for the singers to sing us out of our seats, if we didn't wait for the pastor to get to the point when he had to unbutton that top button, hello, somebody, when that vein popped up in the corner of his head, if we didn't wait for that moment, if we just came through the doors with a mind and ready to praise the Lord, if we just came through the doors and be like David and say, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. When we came to the understanding that we're more than bodies in a building, I don't care what anybody else came to do, but I came to worship the Lord. I came to thank him for what he's done in my life. Do I have about two people in here with me today that said I just came to worship the Lord? I'm not concerned about what you're doing today. I'm not concerned about how much you paid to get your hair did, how much you paid to get your nails done. I'm not concerned about what you're wearing today, but I'm wondering about my God. Where would I be if it had not been for the Lord who was on my side? I'm so glad right now because I have peace that surpasses all understanding. A peace that lets me know that it's going to be all right. Grab somebody by the hand and say, neighbor, I've got peace. Oh, shake it, shake it, shake it. Say, I got peace, I got peace, I got peace. I got peace. Oh, we can live in the present and the peace that God has given you. Oh, there's something about this moment. I'm just about done. Jesus came preaching peace. Paul reminded them that you don't have to stay in bondage because once again, once you move beyond a past that's littered with problems, can I get a witness up in here? When we look at the fact, amen, that there's something about the God that we serve. I can forget about my problems. I can forget about my past. And I can say, God, here I am. My present can be lived with peace. But understand, I got a path before me that's full of potential, that's loaded with potential. My future, if I stay with the Lord, he is going to take care of me. I got a path that's loaded with potential that if I stick with God, if I stay with God, if I don't get sidetracked, if I don't get turned around, if I don't give up before I get to my breakthrough, everything going to be all right. Can I get a witness in here? I'm just about done. Get ready to close out. Get ready to head down to Zebulun. But understand this. What are you trying to say? Pastor Frank White, the church has got to be the church. We got to be willing. We got to be ready. We got to be able to say, God, thank you for where you brought me from. God, thank you for looking beyond my faults and seeing my needs. Thank you, God, for bringing me out, for bringing me up. I'm so glad that the psalmist is declared in Psalm 119, 105, when he said, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. What God is saying, hallelujah, is that when you know, hallelujah, what the Lord has brought you through, when you know that the Lord, hallelujah, has brought you out when you know that the Lord has made a difference in your life. Can I get a witness in here? I'm so glad that when I think about where the Lord has brought me from, I'm so glad that I'm more than a body in the building. 
I'm more than just a number. I'm more than just somebody that came in off the street. I'm somebody that came through the door with an understanding that God has been good. I'm glad that I can say that my life has been sweeter than my path has been neater because the Lord kept me from straying too far. He brought me back every now and then. We all have got to remind ourselves that if it had not been for God who was doing it for me, I would have been messed up. And because of the fact he brought me out, because of the fact he sought me out, because while I was yet a sinner, he went to a hill called Calvary. And because he died, I've got life. Is there anybody that can say thank you? God for the path that I'm on is loaded with potential blessings on my left hand blessings on my right hand hello somebody I can say as the songwriter said blessed assurance Jesus is mine oh what a foretaste of glory divine heir of salvation purchase of God born of a spirit washed in his blood. This is my story. This is my song. I'm going to praise him. I'm going to praise him. I'm going to praise him. All, all the day long. Thank you. Thank you. Great is thy faithfulness. Oh God, of my father, there is no shadow of turning with all I needed, thy hand had provided. Great is, great is thy faithfulness. Anybody know that God has been faithful? It's time for the church to be faithful to the one who brought us out, who brought us through. Are you grateful? For what he did, say yeah, say yeah, say yeah, say yeah, yeah. I got to stop. I got to stop. I got to stop. I got to stop. Because understand this. Understand this. You've got to know that you're more than a body in a building. You're more than an offering in an offering plate. You're more than somebody that's sitting in a seat. You've got to know that the same God that saved me, saved you. The same God that loved me, loves you. You've got to be able to say, yes, Jesus loves me for the Bible. For the Bible tells me so. Stand to your feet. I'm done. I got to get us out of here. Understand. I want to go crazy preacher right about now. God, with his good self, delivered you from darkness. I know people think you got it together. Matter of fact, you know you're looking good right now. It's all right. Amen. You can do your hair like that, do what you used to do. My mom had a way. I got a picture in my office of her back in the day when she had her hair a certain way and she would put her hand on her hip. And she put her hand, hand up, the right hand up on her hair. And she would lift that hair up 
because she knew she was looking good. Couldn't tell her nothing. But get this. People see the exterior. And it'd be a wonderful thing if the exterior was always a reflection of what our interior is. We can dress up, we can fix up, we can shine up, we can smell good and all those wonderful things. That's why I tell folk, don't get it twisted. You can watch stuff on TV and everybody looks like they're happy. They men they're running around turning cartwheels and all of the beautiful things. And we 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 mastered fixing up and looking good and going to church. We've mastered being able to smile. We we mastered being able, amen, to hallelujah. And we've mastered doing those things. But if the truth be told, a lot of folk. are just fixing up. And the fix up is the cover up. Can I be real with you? We fix up so we can cover up all the stuff. And honey, hear me, there's some things that Maybelline can't hide. Because when you have been beat down, when you have been broken up, the church should be that place where you can come in and just keep it real. Have your way, oh God. Hallelujah. Can I say this and I want to keep it real? Every Sunday, until we come to the 1st of October, can we, while we're in this series, I know it's going to be controversial. So I'll say I'll leave first Sunday because we haven't had communion. But next Sunday, come as you are. You ain't got to fix up. You ain't just already. I know somebody said, well, that's dressed down Sunday anyway, Pastor. You ain't said nothing. But first Sunday, because of communion, we're going to make sure we do it right. But the second Sunday in September, third Sunday in September, fourth Sunday in September, can we just say you get up on Sunday and come to church? Huh? You ain't got to put on four or five outfits. And not just outfits, but you with shoes. I was guilty of it this morning. I put on a pair of shoes this morning, and for whatever, they had my feet in a headlock. I don't know if that bad boy swole up or something last night. But I walked around like one minute, and I said, no, this ain't going to work today. Uh-uh. My feet said, thank you, Jesus. Understand this. God wants to bless you. When we go through, when we have our moments, they are to build you. God doesn't want you walking around burdened. When we come into the household of God, and I'm just going to be as just as transparent as I can be, we'll just come with the word, come with the word. Because you're more 
than a body. Hello, somebody. God said, I bless you so that you might be a blessing. And my time, amen, hallelujah, over the course of this series, amen, is to show you how, amen, of a bless, how much of a blessing you are. You are in this world not by happenstance, but God has a purpose and he has a plan for your life. Every head bowed, every eye closed. I got to just get us out of here. Father, I thank you right now. Thank you, God. For the church. Thank you, God. For being called blessed. Thank you, God. For your delivering power. So, God, as we come through those doors... We're going to come in with smiles on our faces. We come through those doors over the course of these weeks. We're going to look at every aspect of the church. We're going to see, amen, why the body needs certain things in order for it to work. If you're broken, guess what? This is a hospital. God wants you to to be blessed by the word. And while there's a corrective nature that comes with the word, God wants you to know that when you get right, I've got more in store for you. And Father, I pray right now that there might be someone under the sound of my voice that may not know you in the pardoning of their sins. If there's one here today that does not know Jesus, you have not accepted, you have not acknowledged the fact, amen, that you can't make it without the Lord. If you're here, I want you to come down and give me your hand and let me lead you in this prayer. Again, all have sinned. 